As a child, I thought that I could find the one and live with her for the rest of my life. How naive it was. Life can change in one second, and what you used to dream about doesn't matter now. You need to take action and fight for your honor. Let me tell you my story. All I could hear was wah wah wah, reminiscent of the adults in Charlie Brown movies. My hearing seemed to shut off five minutes ago, and the noise was replaced by an overwhelming roar as anger surged through me. My knuckles turned white as I clenched my fists on the table, no longer paying attention to my wife's attempts to explain what she had just shared. Fifteen minutes earlier, I had come home from work, looking forward to a relaxing Friday night with a beer in the start of the weekend with my wife. However, the reality was quite different. Despite having the beer on the table, my wife dropped a bombshell with five words. Honey, we need to talk. Before delving into the heart of the story, let me provide some background. I'm David, a 29-year-old with a master's degree in computer science, working at an IT consulting firm. Standing at 5'11 and weighing about 205 low Bs, I maintain my shape with daily gym visits and a 5 a.m. morning run. My wife, Mary, is two years younger, 5'5", five five, curvy yet fit, with blonde hair, blue eyes, toned legs, a stunning figure, and a beautiful face. We met in college, where she was finishing her bachelor's degree in accounting, and I was pursuing my master's. We hit it off instantly, dated through college, and got married about a year after graduating. Mary, having strong feminist beliefs, initially considered hyphenating her last name with mine, but after a practical conversation, she embraced the name change. Fast forward almost five years into our marriage, and we were planning to start a family. Due to her pill-related issues, we used condoms, saving the night of our fifth anniversary to go without them for the first time, marking a special occasion for us. This brings us to the present situation. Returning to the start of this distressing tale, with a beer in my hand and seated across from my wife, I heard five dreadful words that ignited my anger. She expressed her desire to try something different for a month or so before starting a family, wanting to eliminate any lingering doubts before becoming a mother. As I processed the information, I couldn't fathom the idea of her wanting to date other men while being married to me, essentially breaking our vows and expecting my acceptance. I confronted her, emphasizing my disbelief and frustration at her proposal. Despite my objection, she explained that it was a temporary arrangement, assuring me that she would return to being a loving and faithful wife after this short period. She justified her actions by claiming it wouldn't be cheating as long as I was aware and accepting of it, intending to be open about her encounters. In an attempt to comprehend the origin of this bewildering idea, I questioned her, suspecting Margaret, her four-time divorced colleague, played a role. My suspicions were confirmed, as she mentioned seeking advice from Margaret, who advocated for this experience as a way to clear her mind before starting a family. Frustrated by her insistence and finding her rationale absurd, I warned her about potential consequences for our relationship. Despite my objections, she remained resolute, asserting her decision to proceed with the plan. I reluctantly agreed not to touch her during these episodes, but I made it clear that I would not approve or welcome such activities in our shared space. As the conversation progressed, I emphasized that if she insisted on pursuing this against my wishes, she would have to leave the house during these encounters. I reminded her that the house belonged to me, a gift from my parents before our marriage, and I could decide who lived there. Despite her resistance, I stood firm in conveying the potential repercussions of her choice on our relationship and her living situation. Margaret suggested I move in with her, and after a cold night, she tried to convince me to sleep in the other bedroom. However, I insisted that the bed was as much mine as hers and I would sleep there. If she didn't want to share the bed with me, she could find another place to sleep. We pretty much avoided each other the next day. Around 8 woo in the evening, Mary came downstairs dressed in an LBD, stockings, and 4-inch heels. She had styled hair, night-on-the-town makeup, and jewelry, holding only a small clutch. I asked her if she had forgotten anything, mentioning suitcases, clothes, cosmetics, toiletries, and the like. She brushed it off, saying she was only leaving for the night and would be back before morning. 
I warned her that if she walked out, I would change the locks, emphasizing that she wouldn't live here if she insisted on this. She insisted I loved her enough to let her go, and I countered that she didn't love me enough not to leave. I mentioned changing the locks and packing her belongings. As she was about to respond, a car horn sounded from the driveway. She claimed it was Margaret and said we would talk when she got home. Unbeknownst to her, I had installed hidden apps on her phone, allowing me to track her location, read her messages, record phone conversations, and even activate her microphone and camera without her knowledge. I activated her microphone as soon as she left, recording her conversation with Margaret while they drove. I planned to listen to it later. I started my work, replacing the door locks, reprogramming the garage door opener, removing the remote control, and packing all her clothes, toiletries, and cosmetics into boxes. Two hours later, I loaded her things into the car. It was time to listen to her conversation with Margaret. Margaret assured her that I would be angry for a week, but it would pass. She advised Mary to blow my mind with better sex and said that guys could be easily manipulated with the right rewards. They laughed and exchanged comments about a setup with another guy, with Margaret emphasizing taking off her panties and leaving them in the car. They found humor in the situation, and Mary described Margaret's provocative traits and her four divorces by the age of 26. I've been successful in avoiding any involvement in a threesome or more with her. While they were on their way to the club, I attempted to eavesdrop, but the noise made it impossible to catch any conversations. Resorting to online banking, I used her GPS location to withdraw half the money from our joint account, paid off and canceled shared credit cards, and transferred savings to an offshore account. Additionally, about 70% of our investments went into a separate account in my name. When I noticed her GPS moving, I activated the microphone on her phone and overheard her conversing with an unfamiliar male voice. The guy mentioned going back to her house for some alone time, using the spare bedroom, and inviting someone named Margaret to join later. I took precautions, leaving shampoo and body wash in the spare bathroom. The glimpses I caught of the guy through her phone's camera didn't leave much of an impression. He appeared around 30 with thinning black hair and seemed slightly shorter than me. Once they arrived at Margaret's house, I resumed listening, hoping to catch evidence of her infidelity. Realizing the need for her phone to be in the same room for audio evidence. I turned everything off. Then, when she received my call, she dismissed my concerns and assured me everything was fine. Unbeknownst to her, I took advantage of her inebriation and placed the phone on the nightstand with a clear view of the bed. Although I doubted its admissibility in court, I watched enough of the video to confirm their intimate activities. She decided not to return home, choosing to stay with Margaret. Over the weekend, I kept busy with household projects and worked on restoring my 1972 GMC pickup. I had recently replaced the engine, transmission, differential, seats, and applied matte black paint. The distraction of these tasks and cutting off communication with Mary allowed me to finish the truck and prepare for divorce. I consulted a lawyer and started drafting divorce papers, bringing an end to the Trueblood relationship. There's really no way around it. The divorce laws in this state seem to favor women. Let's be honest, if you're a man, you're at a disadvantage in a divorce. Women manage to victimize the faithful husband, leaving him to financially support her philandering lifestyle. There isn't much a guy can do to safeguard himself. So, when Friday evening arrived, my truck was clean and I was ready for the night. After a shower, shave, and a touch of cologne, I dressed up in new Levi's jeans, a black button-down shirt, and rattlesnake leather cowboy boots. To treat myself, I went to a nice steakhouse for dinner. Skipping the details, the T-bone, baked potato, and vegetables were excellent, as was the salad. Let's move on to the main event. Leaving the restaurant, I confirmed that Mary was indeed at the club with Margaret, who had arrived about half an hour ago. It was time to put my plan into action. I had every reason to believe this would drive Mary crazy, and I couldn't help but smile as I parked a couple of spaces away from her car. Mary seemed to be the designated driver this time, making my plan a bit easier since I didn't have to worry about Margaret being stranded. Not that I was concerned about myself. 
My main worry was convincing Margaret to leave with me if she was driving. Having a plan in mind as well as a backup in case Margaret had moral objections, I entered the club. Margaret wasn't hard to spot. Margaret, I didn't know you'd be here, I said, approaching their table with a glass in my hand. I waited until Mary got up to dance with some guy. Rob, what are you doing here? Margaret asked nervously. Probably the same as you, I replied. Since Mary moved in, I thought I'd try this club and have some fun tonight. Speaking of which, would you like to dance? Margaret hesitated but agreed, and we danced for three fast songs before a slow one came on. I didn't give her a chance to leave. As soon as the music started, I pulled her close. About a song and a half later, Mary noticed me. I almost burst out laughing when her surprise turned to fear, thinking she had been caught. After the song ended, she left the dance floor and returned to their table, looking at me with poorly concealed anger. Little did she know, I hadn't even started to make her angry yet. Margaret held me tightly as we continued to dance, and as I mentioned earlier, Margaret is a bombshell, so it didn't take long for things to get, well, attention-worthy. It didn't take her long to catch on. She looked at me with a broad smile, drawing herself even closer. Facing AA, I gradually placed my hand on Margaret's backside. When the song concluded, I escorted Margaret back to their table. She invited me to join them, and naturally, I agreed. On our way back, we halted to ask the waitress to refresh our drinks. Being a gentleman, I suggested putting all three drinks on my tab. Mary, however, confronted me and Griley questioning my precincts. I responded that I was there for the same reasons as her, to drink, dance, and have fun. She accused me of attempting to ruin her evening, but I dismissed it, explaining I had no idea she would be there. As I tried to engage with Margaret, Mary sat with anger, attempting to make me jealous by dancing flirtatiously with other guys. Ignoring her, I focused on Margaret and prevented others from asking her to dance. Margaret and I monopolized our time, making it clear we were together. After a couple of hours, I decided it was time. Margaret was prepared and we left for my place. She seemed unconcerned about Mary, and when I mentioned Mary would be home soon, Margaret nonchalantly responded that it didn't matter. Mary could find her own way home. In the car, I kept her tense, and at her place, we didn't waste any time. The sex was intense, and I barely noticed when the front door slammed. Margaret, being loud, didn't notice either. In the morning, we had breakfast awkwardly. Mary smirked when making coffee, but there was little conversation between us. Afterward, I left, leaving Mary furious. Motivated by this, I began contacting Mary's attractive single colleagues, convincing them to go on dates with me. Despite some initial hesitation due to our marital status, I assured them of our separation. As Mary shared her escapades at work and Mary's friends heard about my dates, tensions grew between Mary, Margaret, and the other single women in the office. I started meeting Mary's friends and colleagues, creating additional strains in our relationships. I socialized with them, inviting them for drinks, dinner, and dances. I strategically made appearances where AA was, utilizing GPS tracking and voice video apps on her phone. I heard from her colleagues that they were impressed with our dates. Despite AA bringing other guys along, she and Margaret began to clash more, and I reveled in my good times, dining, dancing, and engaging in intimate encounters. I also enjoyed listening to Mary's rants. However, things took an unexpected turn when Margaret confronted Mary about our supposed plan. Mary expressed disappointment explaining that I was supposed to wait for her to conclude her adventures before starting a family. Margaret, too, was puzzled by the situation. Nevertheless, Mary revealed that after having her fun, she planned to return to me as our anniversary was approaching, and we had a plan to start a family. Margaret, outraged, questioned why Mary brought me into the picture and spent the night with her husband. Mary defended herself, claiming she had lusted after me for years, and that I was the one who initiated things. She also mentioned that I had checked on all our single colleagues. As the final part of my plan, I called my lawyer, giving her last instructions. 
With just over a week until our anniversary, I prepared for a memorable celebration. When Mary called to go home, I refused, citing surprise plans and housework. I dropped hints about a nursery, fueling her anticipation for a family surprise. On the anniversary evening, our planned party was underway with friends and family. Mary arrived, surprised by the festivities. I announced her as the guest of honor, and Rob arrived, causing confusion. I reassured Mary that it was a big celebration with our loved ones, and the evening unfolded with dinner, drinks, and laughter. The surprise continued with changes to the house, including a pool in the backyard, leaving Mary astonished. On the top floor, she subtly hinted that she wanted to see my renovations, still believing I had transformed one of the bedrooms into a nursery. Now it's time to unveil the remaining surprises. May I have your attention, please? I have some announcements for this special day, I called out, urging everyone to calm down and listen. With the stereo turned off, Silence fell, and the guests gathered around. Thank you all for being here today. I have a couple of important announcements. Mary, could you join me here, please? After she stood beside me, I continued. Firstly, I want everyone to know that yesterday marked my last day at work. Only my former boss is aware of this, as I provided a month's notice and explained my plans. I am excited to announce that I am starting my own consulting company, allowing me more time to spend with my family. Highlighting the significance of the day, I continued. As you all know, today is Mary and my fifth anniversary. What most of you don't know is that we plan to start our family on this day. As a special anniversary gift, I want to commemorate our relationship. I took a few steps aside, nodding to the red-haired woman in the group. She stepped forward, saying, Mary Bader, you've been served. Continuing, I revealed, what most of you don't know is that two months ago, Mary informed me that she intended to date and sleep with other men. She didn't seek my agreement, leaving me no choice. For the past two months, she has been living with a friend, bringing different men to her home for intimacy. This is something I won't tolerate. To be fair, I also dated other women, but only after Mary broke her wedding vows. Amidst Mary's scream, I announced, for your actions, I'm granting you a divorce so you can pursue whatever you want. Rest assured, it won't be me. Mary believed I was doing renovations on the house, which I indeed did. I showcased the added pool and other enhancements. Beneath, I repainted the master bedroom, installed a new shower, and added a jacuzzi tub to the master bath. I merged the smaller spare bedrooms into a larger one for a specific reason. While explaining... A red-haired woman and a ten-year-old girl approached me. Meet my lawyer, Tara Oi, and her daughter, Simone. Tara is a single mother, and we've become very close over the past two months. Once the divorce is final, and she is no longer my lawyer, we plan to be together. Tara and Simone will be moving in with me. Turning back to Mary, I concluded, So, Mary, as for what to do with your... I instructed you to take your suitcases back to your car. You won't return here. I made it clear that I wouldn't tolerate this, yet you rushed ahead and shattered our marriage. Mary was crying uncontrollably, her family yelling in the background, while most friends hurriedly left. My own family sat in shock and Tara and Simone discreetly went upstairs, prepared for this reaction as we had discussed. Truthfully, Tara and I hadn't even kissed. We went out for dinner, spent some evenings with her and Simone at their apartment, but we agreed to put everything on hold until my divorce was finalized. Mary, who divorced her husband five years ago for cheating, left the house multiple times but never found that spark again. After everyone left, I didn't know where Mary went. On the same day, I deleted all the spy apps I had on her. I no longer cared about her actions. Would it have been better to handle this differently? Perhaps. Maybe I shouldn't have involved Tara and especially Simone. Why did I do this? The simple answer is anger. I was furious at what Mary did, and I wanted everyone to know she ruined our marriage with her selfishness. I wanted to make her feel the pain she caused me, killing my love and turning it into hatred. I desired her to experience the loss of love and the resulting hatred. Instead, I could have taken more mature and less painful actions, 
serving her at work or sending evidence packets. But I did what I did. Mary returned to Margaret, and this continued for about two weeks before they started clashing, leading her to get her own small apartment. I often see her in the city, her facial expression alternating between sadness and anger. We don't exchange pleasantries. Her family, whom I sometimes encounter when having dinner with Tara and Simone, frowns at us, but we simply ignore it. Regarding Tara and Simone, Mary tried to fight the divorce, but soon realized it was futile. Tara allowed me to increase the pressure on Mary by continuing to meet her colleagues. Mary eventually signed the papers after hearing a positive report about our night together from her colleague. On the day the documents officially dissolved my marriage, Tara and Simone moved in with me. A year later, Tara and I got married, and another year later, we met Mary at a street fair. Mary, upon seeing Tara's six-month pregnant belly, turned and ran away, sobbing. How do you like the story? Write your opinion in the comments and what valuable lessons you learned from it. Let me know in the comments. Good luck and bye.